Yeah, I want to um, just mention also that uh, Jeremy will, will be gone this weekend doing a wedding down uh, in Kansas City, so we're missing him on Sunday, but uh, I congratulate those who are getting married down there, and he'll be back next week, and of course, I'm back time for the seminar. So, Hosea 14 tonight. Open your Bibles to Hosea 14. We'll try to wrap up the chapter through verses 4 through 9. Uh, talking about some trees, interesting plants going on here in Hosea 14. As we have a little lesson in trees tonight, uh, apparently concerning Israel's return. There's a lot of language about trees in the Bible and plants and flowers and things like that, but, uh, particularly around the land of Israel. Uh, seeing as God had promised a, an actual land with animals and trees and things in it, to the people of Israel. And so this is why a lot of the Old Testament uses that type of flowery, flowery language, uh, pun intended there. So in Hosea 14, verse 3, we left off last week dealing with verse 2, uh, and we, we started verse 3 talking about the grace that would be given to Israel and how they needed to, to say to God, receive us graciously. And that grace in the Old, Old Testament uh, that was prophesied about Israel and they're receiving it in their new covenant, their new testament. The new covenant is Israel's covenant of grace. And uh, that, of course, is fulfilled in their kingdom. According to the prophecy here, Israel receives grace when they get that kingdom, when their salvation comes, when the Lord, the Messiah, comes and dwells with them, when he saves them from the wilderness. And so, we, in that context, verse 3, Israel is speaking here still, and it says, Asher shall not save us. And uh, Asher is uh, the name of the son of Shem in the Old Testament who built Nineveh, which came to be the capital city of Assyria. And so the Assyrians were those that God would use to judge the northern tribes of Israel pre uh, previously in the book. And by this point, they're saying Asher will not save us. So they're not trusting anymore uh, these other political entities that are bigger than them to help them. They're trusting God, which is a good place to be. That's what they're saying here. Uh, we will not ride upon horses, is what he says, and neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods. The idea of riding upon horses means uh, we're not going to be trusting our own armies, and that's the idea there. So not, they're, not, they're not committing idolatry, they're not trusting their own might, they're not trusting others who are more powerful, they're trusting God, he is their refuge, he's their shield, he is their uh, warrior, and that sort of business. So uh, this is Israel giving up their idolatry and false worship and the works of their own hands, yeah. which should seem familiar to you, seeing as we understand salvation by the grace of God being without works. Mm -hmm. And this is what they're saying in their future kingdom. We're not trusting our works to save us, but we're trusting God to save us. Mm -hmm. And we say amen to that. <laughs> That's what everyone should do throughout the Bible, is trust God to save them. And so then in verse uh, 3, it says, Ye are our gods. Uh, we will not say to the work of our hands, Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. But instead, God is the one that gives mercy. Yeah. And so they're giving, giving up idolatry here. Verse 4 is God then speaking. God says, I will hear, heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. And so this I will shows up. And every time in the Bible you see God say, I will, I will, that's grace is what that is. Uh, and I am going to do, and God's name, of course, is I am, speaking to his grace and, and who he is. Um, but when he says, I will and not you should, you know, that's a good thing to claim right there. And so this is God saying, I will heal their backsliding. Israel, as we've covered the last 14 chapters, has slid into a pit that they cannot climb out of. They've dug themselves into a hole, and they can't get out without God's help. They're going to be judged because of their sin and idolatry, and how are they going to save themselves? They can't. Hosea 14 is their future realization that they can't. They're going to trust God, and God responds to that saying, I will heal your backsliding. I'll help you back. That's what he's saying. He goes on to say, I will love them freely. So again, another I will. I will love them freely. That is grace. Amen. I don't love you with conditions. I love you freely. That's the kind of love that Hosea 1, 2, and 3 was talking about that should have been there in the marriage, right? <clears throat> and so this free love, this free grace. Um, the next time in the Bible the word freely is found concerning Israel is in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. So way over in Revelation 21, which should not shock you because that's what Hosea 14 is talking about, Israel's salvation. Revelation is talking about Jesus being the Lord God who comes and brings Israel's salvation on the earth. Revelation 21, in verse 6, <clears throat> in the new heavens and new earth here, uh, this is when God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death nor sorrow, nor crime. We've covered this in past lessons recently. 
And then he says in verse 5, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are, faith, are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. So it describes this new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth. It's going to go on to describe this, this, uh, the, the trees that are planted there, and the throne that is there, and the water running there. And he says here that they can drink of the fountain of the water of life freely. And so this is Israel near New Jerusalem drinking freely from the water of life. And that's God graciously saying, I'll love them freely. Right? Their covenants, you see the verse there where it says it is done? Their covenants are done. God has fulfilled what he promised to them. All the prophecies about bringing them back, all the prophecies about giving them the land, all the prophecies we'll see in a bit about their trees flourishing and all that is now done in Revelation 20 and 6. Um, and that's where he says you'll drink freely of the water of life. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 17, <clears throat> next chapter, covers in detail the manner of fruits and trees that are on either side of the river that proceeds out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Uh, it has the water of life there. And in verse 17, it says, The Spirit and bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. So you see the free water of life there. Okay, now this, of course, is after the great white throne judgment. This is after the new heaven and the new earth. This is after there's no more death, which tells us all that's not happening now. Right, so this fountain, these trees, and, and Christ reigning on the earth, and Israel being back on their land, and the curse being removed is not happening now. Right? That's what we learned from Revelation 21 22. Uh, however, we do read the word freely in Paul's epistles. And so even though the next time it shows up concerning Israel's revelation, Paul uses the word freely. And it's one of the things that makes the revelation of the mystery unique. Because Israel's under covenants, the whole world was waiting and hoping for those covenants to be fulfilled so that they can get the water of life freely, that curse would be removed. And here comes the Apostle Paul as Christ appeared to him and revealed to him this mystery about him and salvation, uh, kept secret since the world began. In Romans 3, 24, he says that we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so the, the need for grace, we studied in Hosea 14, verse 2 already last week. But Paul says, justified freely by his grace, and he's talking about people right now in this dispensation not waiting for it. And that's, of course, in Christ Jesus. He goes on to preach and declare the cross there. Romans 8, 32. There's another place in Romans where we just finished this. If by just you mean 19 weeks ago, <laughs> our, last, our last visit in Romans 8, in verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So here we are in Christ, and we received all these things freely. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, Paul says, We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us, that are freely given to us, of God. According to the mystery, God has dispensed His abundant grace, giving salvation and all spiritual blessings and unsearchable riches to those members of the body, now freely. And so you don't have to wait for the freely accessible graces of God that will come upon all people on the earth through Israel, Revelation 21 and 22. You have free salvation freely given to you through the finished work of Christ because you're not subject to the covenants God made with the earth. Amen. According to those covenants, you don't deserve to get that grace freely. According to those covenants, you're sinners that have no, no, no recourse. But according to the gospel of the grace of God, God can righteously justify you without Israel, without the law, without covenants, and thus you can freely receive God's grace Amen. if you trust the gospel today. And so Israel's waiting for freely. You have freely. See the difference there? Now, you say, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. How come Israel suffers so much? Well, their freely in the future comes with healing on their wings and trees and fruits and prosperity. Your freely today doesn't get any of that. So <laughs> you have freely given salvation, but you don't get free healing or nothing. You don't get any of that stuff. So there's still this excellence that's going to come. It's just Israel's salvation and their covenants tied to that. Okay. Hosea 14, down in verse 4, says, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them, and, uh, or from him. And that, that's what we mentioned last week, uh, talking about how God at this time in Hosea 14 could say, 
my anger's turned away. When for the last, again, 13 chapters, he's been preaching about the judgment that comes upon Israel. And uh, how is it that his anger's turned away? What has assuaged his wrath? What has atoned for Israel's sins after God has said, I'm going to take you out of the land, remove your kings, you won't be a nation anymore. Uh, uh, you'll be no more my people, lo am I. I'll have no more mercy on you, lo Rama, right? What changes his mind? Remember Hosea 11, God said, it repenteth me, I have repentings in my mind. What changes his mind? Well, we saw, saw in Hosea, it was something about the promises he made, which means he has to save these people. But how can he righteously do that? And the, you and I know the answer, and that's, of course, through Christ Jesus. So it's the cross of Christ that does all this, that makes this possible. Amen. That cross of Christ was still a mystery back here. So there was a promise in place that God had to give them grace, but there was no explanation of how. Even God himself says, I have to do it. I made a promise to do it. I promised your fathers to do it, right? But they didn't know how. You now know how. So you, according to the Revelation of the Mystery, know how you're saved without any covenants today, and you know how their covenants can be fulfilled because of the cross of Christ. Amen. Right, because that's the message we preach, and we understand that. So the cross of Christ does all this, and it does more, by the way. We'll hear more about this in our seminar. The cross of Christ doesn't only fulfill these covenants. It does more than that, and then it provides something more excellent for you according to the mystery. And so we'll, we'll deal with that in our seminar coming up. So what, what we're seeing here is that these prophecies where it says, I, I will love you freely, I'll heal your backsliding, talking about sinful Israel breaking his covenant, his anger being turned away necessitates God's grace. It necessitates the cross of Christ. It makes it a necessity yeah. in order for God's word to be fulfilled. So Christ came and he had to die. And why did he have to die? Well, for verses like this. I mean, God said this had to happen. The only way to get there is through, through the cross. So he had to be a sacrifice to make this possible, all right? And uh, what, what we learned in our dispensation that it wasn't just to make Israel's salvation possible, it was to make everything else possible, the, his, his manifold uh, wisdom and, and the mystery of his will possible. Mm -hmm. And so there was this, this secret hidden will that God had that we now understand. Move on to verse 5. You can see all that between the lines in Isaiah 14. You've got to be very careful as a Bible student that rightly divides the word of the truth, not to put back into those verses things that are not there. We know what was in God's mind only because God's told us now. Yeah. But he didn't say it here in detail, right? So we can, we can appreciate what God's purpose was all along, kept secret, but uh, it was not revealed in Hosea 14, all right? Even though we can preach from these as springboards here. Verse 5. God says, I will, another I will. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Thirdly, I will be as the dew unto Israel. Mm -hmm. So we see the healing of the backsliding. That's the, that's the forgiveness of sins, bringing them back into the right standing. I will love them. That's the grace he gives them in their salvation. And a lot of people talk about the new covenant in those terms and those terms alone. It's God dealing with sin. It's God saving people. But this third I will here that they forget that the new covenant entails. Mm -hmm. This third I will, which is I will be as the dew unto Israel. Oh, yeah, that's nice language, the dew, like, you know, morning dew, that's, that's refreshing, yeah, comforting. No, it's more than that. He is going to make their plant grow and flourish. He cut their tree down and cut off the branches when they sinned and broke the covenant. And he promises that they'll come back and the land itself will flourish. And the land is, is a picture of the people in the land Amen. flourishing and their dominion, Okay. So I will be as the dew, God will. I will heal, I will love them freely, I will water them to grow, I'll make them grow, I'll cause them to come back, I'll bring them back. We've already seen a little bit how he's gonna do that, Hosea 6, that he'll revive them, bring them back from the dead, right? It's so a resurrection is a part of that. And so we need to make sure we understand the I will be as the dew unto Israel. Those two words there, unto Israel. We were just in the context talking about future salvation, revelation, and here it is again, unto Israel. People say, well, God's done with Israel after the cross. Revelation's all about the church, and you know, everyone's the same now, no Jew or Gentile. Then what's that word right there unto Israel? Because it's talking in the context of Revelation, talking about in the context of Israel's salvation, the new covenant fulfillment, God's grace and everything, and it says unto Israel. Amen. We even mentioned the cross of Christ was necessary for verse uh, 4 to happen. Verse 5 says unto Israel. Israel was still a thing in the covenants of God and God's promises. And of course, that's clear throughout the Old Testament. And so we can't hide behind the idea that, well, the New Testament has gotten rid of all that. If God said it, he must keep his word. 
Now, it doesn't mean just because God said it, he's doing it today. But if God said he will do, then he will do. Amen. Right? And so I will be as the dew to Israel. Revelation 2021 is when he becomes that. 2021 there. So what's the do? He's going to plant Israel. What's going to happen here is he's going to plant in Israel, in their land, and they're going to flourish in their kingdom. And that, folks, is the new covenant. The new covenant is their forgiveness of sins, their salvation, and their flourishing in their land. Which is why you know the new covenant is not being fulfilled today. It can't if that third thing's not going on. Okay? And so you have them in the land of the kingdom. Look at Isaiah 5, verse 7. I'm going to spend some time here talking about trees in the Bible. So you botanists and biologists will have a good time probably. I don't know. Isaiah 5, verse 7. And we studied this chapter uh, before uh, in our Isaiah studies. And notice how the vineyard here is defined. God's vineyard. The vineyard is not a church out in California. It's not a, a group that creates uh, poorly worded contemporary Christian songs. Um, the vineyard is in the Bible, Israel. It says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteous, but behold, a cry. Isaiah 5 tells this, he gives this picture of God planting this vineyard in this land. He hedges it about, protects it, and has fences and everything else. And then they don't produce the fruit, even though he's protected it and pruned it and that sort of thing. And he describes in verse 7 what this vineyard represents. So he's not just telling a story and making you interpret it. He tells you the interpretation. Yeah. And so, yeah, is there a figure of speech here, a metaphor? Sure, it's a figure of speech. And then God tells you how to interpret it. So we can't allegorize the Bible saying we can make it whatever we want because the Bible tells you what it is. The vineyard is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. There are two, house of Israel, house of Judah. Okay, now it's going to be important because Israel described as a tree, as a plant, as flowers. Again, it's something you see repeated throughout prophecy, and that's intentional. In Amos chapter 9, Amos, of course, is a contemporary, if you remember, of, of Hosea, speaking of a similar content. Sometimes Amos just says things a little more forthrightly. But Amos chapter 9, verse 13, look what he says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that sows the seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine. That, that's pretty good, by the way. Like, they can't even harvest while there's more fruit coming up. Okay? And the, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. There's no figures there. They'll bring back his people. They'll inhabit the cities that he builds. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. There's no figure there. That's like they're going to actually plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. And Amos closes his book. That's it. The last word that Amos says is, I'm going to bring Israel back. Yeah. And they'll be in the land, and they won't be plucked out ever again. Yeah. Well, that obviously didn't happen 2,000 years ago at 70 AD, because they were plucked out of their land. And, yeah. you know, it's Amos 9, verse 15 hasn't yet been fulfilled. Right. The people today say, well, they're back in the land now. We've covered that before. Those aren't believing Israel. These aren't people saying, receive us graciously, O Lord, yeah. trusting the Messiah. But there's a prophecy here about they won't be pulled out. Notice the language it uses. I will plant them upon their land. Hosea mentioned before how God saw Israel in the wilderness back in Exodus as a vine, right? And so God sees them as a plant. He pl sees them as a seed. He planted the seed back there, and they grew up. And he expected fruit from them, and they didn't have fruit. And so he chopped the branches off, you know, and then he cut it down, and then he says, I'm going to bring it back, right? This is throughout the prophets and how they speak of Israel and God's covenants with them. It's interesting in Amos chapter 9, verse 13 through 15 here, about this promise of the days will come when he will plant them in their land. Because the, the verses prior to what we just read in verses 11 and 12 are quoted in Acts chapter 15 by James in Jerusalem. He's quoting them because it says in Acts chapter, not, or Amos rather, 9 verse, uh, verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name. So James quotes it after hearing Paul going to Gentiles going, you know what? You know, there was something in the prophecies about uh, the Gentiles uh, being called by God's name. Yep. 
But when is that? Apparently here, it's before 13, 14, and 15. So James didn't quote 13, 14, and 15 and say, that's fulfilled this day in your ears because they were not planted in their land never to, never to be taken out. Okay. So James speaking there and it being written in the book of Acts by inspiration of the Holy Ghost did not say that Israel is in their land forever is fulfilled. Okay, he's talking about Gentiles hearing the word. Meanwhile, let's go back to Hosea 14, verse 5. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily. Grow as the lily? How do you, what does that mean, growing as a lily? Well, fortunately, again, the Bible gives us an understanding here. Not only that, but again, if you're a botanist or a biologist, maybe you can learn things about lilies. It might teach you something about how they're going to grow and come back. You know, it's verses like this in the Bible where it says like that and like this, and have you ever seen this happen in nature, that causes people to go, no, we haven't, and then go study it, and then learn science and figure things out and go, whoa, isn't that amazing? The Bible says there's paths in the seas, and lo and behold, the guy who read the thing goes out and finds that there's paths in the seas. And you read this, they grow as a lily. How's a lily grow? And you go back and you learn how lilies grow. You say, how does that work? Right? And you start learning things. Some things are just... You find them, find them in the farmer's almanac today. You find them in you know, just plant guides today, but they're not always known. But when God writes these things, it's for people to, to know and to learn. Okay? So it's interesting. God made, you heard me say before, I think, I believe the Bible teaches that God made creation in order for us to understand who God is and, and what he's going to do so that he can use language like this as pictures to uh, help us understand. Amen. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit because we know what real fruit is. It comes from trees, and it's the sweet part. You know, it's good. Right? That's, that's why we use the term fruit of the Spirit. We know what the body of Christ is because we have actual bodies. Otherwise, the term's meaningless to us. Right? And so God does that. And with Israel, he's talking about trees and vineyards and that sort of business. But we know this lily and how it grows from Matthew 6, 28, among other places in the Bible, if you do a study on lily and lilies. Matthew 6, 28 says, Why take ye thought for raiment, Jesus says? Consider the lilies of the field. And that's what we're doing. How they grow. Well, that's what we want to know. And Jesus says, They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Amen. So Jesus is telling us here how the lilies grow, at least what he's using to teach them about lilies growing. And Jesus came to Israel. What was he teaching, by the way? The gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. What's Hosea 14 about? Israel's kingdom come. And it says, they'll grow as the lilies. And Jesus says, consider the lilies. Like, they're teaching the same thing, folks. How do the lilies grow? Well, Jesus gives more information about that. Hosea just says, they'll grow as the lilies. Jesus says, they don't toil, they don't spin, yet they're arrayed in glory. Well, if they don't work for it, and they don't sew their own clothes, then how in the world are they arrayed in glory? Answer, God did it. God made the lilies grow like that. You throw a lily seed down, you don't have to do much, it just grows up, even among the thorns it grows up. And it looks beautiful. You did nothing for it. What's Hosea 14 say? Receive us graciously. We can't do it. We're not going to trust the work of our hands. We're going to trust God to do it. And God brings them back, and they grow as the lilies. They didn't do anything. That's called grace. Amen. Right? And so you say, well, Israel's back. How'd they get back? They clawed and they toiled. No, that's not how they come back. They come back by God putting them there, and he's the one that makes them glorious. They'll grow as the lilies. Right? Just by looking at the two verses, Jesus explains to you what it is. Right? Prophecy can't be any easier than that, folks. <laughs> when it says something and Jesus explains it, they'll grow as the lilies. We go back to Song of Solomon, which is probably a more popular passage on lilies. <clears throat> Song of Solomon is right before Isaiah. Chapter 2. You don't hear many messages on Song of Solomon. And if you do, okay, <laughs> if you do hear that's not Song of Solomon, it's usually in the context of marriage or husband and wife or something. Yeah. Speaking of my wife. Yeah. Song of Solomon chapter 2. Uh, what people miss really about the Song of Solomon in all the language, the literal flowery language in Song of Solomon, is that uh, this book speaks a lot about Jerusalem and the land of Israel. Psalm, Psalm chapter 2, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Well, who is that? And by tradition, you know, well, that's Jesus, you know. Well, in the context, it's talking about this man and this woman here, okay? But I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. What do we learn about lilies here? 
they can grow among thorns. Like that, that doesn't prevent them from growing apparently, right? It's not one of those sheepish flowers that, you know, if there's a thorn within 50 yards, it wilts over. It's like, it'll grow among the thorns. That's a lily among the thorns. And that's what happens. They'll grow as a lily among thorns without effort. They'll be glorious. You'll have this nation rise up as a city on a hill and all the ones around them will be dark, right? It'll be through this tribulation, the wilderness, that God will bring them out. How did God plant Israel in the first place? In the wilderness. And they started growing. Well, how do you grow things in the wilderness? <laughs> By God's help is how you do that, right? And that's what he's talking about. Look back in Hosea 14. You can stay in the song Psalm if you'd like. We'll be back here in a little bit. Hosea 14 in verse uh, 5. He'll grow as the lily, who's the he? Israel, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Lebanon's gonna show up in the next two verses. Three times in this latter passage of Hosea, it's talking about Lebanon. And so maybe you need a history lesson slightly. What in the world's Lebanon? Where is it at? And it's not really referring here to the political people of Lebanon. It's not like a Lebanon the country or something like that as we might think of it today. Uh, Lebanon was a place in Israel. It was northernmost in the map of Israel. So if you're drawing the map of Israel, which I always do a poor job of, here's the Mediterranean, right? And here's the Dead Sea. You see the Galilee, Jerusalem right there. And you have Israel essentially in this area right here. There's Israel. Lebanon's up here, okay? There's the mountains up here. And Lebanon's up at the, the highest part of Israel. And literally the mountains, the highest mountains in Israel are in Lebanon. So you had mountains down here too, but the highest ones are up here, Mount Hermon and things like that. And so when it talks about Lebanon in your Bible, usually when in context of geography and then geology and things like that, it's talking about either from the north part of Israel, because it's far north, or the highest things in Israel, which is the mountains there, and the trees that grew on them, yeah. the cedars of Lebanon, Amen. which are also long living tall trees, yeah. right? And also very strong and enduring trees. And so when you spoke of the cedars of Lebanon, these were very valuable. Even cedar wood today is a very expensive wood. And so cedars is a very valuable and precious wood. It's an enduring wood. It's a tall tree. It's on these tall mountains. And so it's just this glorious, majestic, high, lifted up type of thing. And that's what the Bible refers to as we said Lebanon. So here it says Israel and this kingdom is going to grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Well, if things aren't rooted very well, they don't last very long, right? But if their roots are as Lebanon, these cedars of Lebanon, as the mountains in Lebanon, they're not going anywhere. That's, right. That's what's going on here. Okay. He'll cast forth his roots of Lebanon. So it's the highest and uppermost part of Israel. Now, the Song of Solomon also mentions Lebanon. <clears throat> so that's Song of Solomon, chapter 4. <clears throat> People get caught up a little bit, I think, and not wrongly. It's, it is a love poem between a man and a woman. Uh, between the man and the woman, though, and the, and the romance there, and it's like saga with the soap opera going on, you know, who's doing what and what's going and who's doing that. But they, they miss the language in between. In fact, you kind of read past it. Like, okay, yeah, fruit trees and rivers and streams and woods and place. Yeah, I get it. But tell me more about this woman or this man, you know. You know what does that mean? But it, it ends up being about Israel because yeah. you really don't know who the woman is. Like, you don't know the woman. And people argue about who the man is, too. Like, is it Solomon? Is it someone else? Is it just a man in Israel? Who is it? It doesn't matter who the man and the woman was in the poem. Sometimes people write poems not about real people, right? You have that too. But it is using language about a land. And so Song of Solomon mentions love. It's a love poem describing love in terms of Israel's land and their trees and fruit and animals. Now, what are we learning in Hosea 14? Are we learning about the love of the Lord? I will love them freely. They will grow as lilies. They will be like the cedars of Lebanon. That, that sounds familiar. That sounds like Song of Solomon. Yeah. And that's not the only place it sounds like Song of Solomon. So when you realize the prophets use trees and fruits and, and mountains to refer to the nation and the God's covenants with them, so when they flourish, it's when the actual land flourishes and vice versa. Then you go back and read Song of Solomon, and you're going, okay, I'm going to find Jerusalem back here. And you find that it mentions Jerusalem and the land and the animals and the trees more than it does any body parts about the man and the woman. Like it always starts out like your neck is like, and then it rambles on for three verses about trees and flowers and streams. And you're going, that's a weird looking neck, you know. But it's about the land. Amen. It's saying your land is going to be prosperous and it's going to be filled in this environment of love, God's love for them, right? 
That's why there's language in the Song of Solomon about waiting and that sort of business, waiting for my love, you know. That's what Israel's supposed to do, isn't it? Yes. Waiting for God to come, God waiting for that time. Then when they meet, there they are in the land. That's Hosea 14. <clears throat> when they come back together, receive us graciously is what they say. So look at Song of Solomon chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 8. <clears throat> Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amina, from the top of Shinar and Hermon. These are mountains in Lebanon. So look at me from the top of these mountains, the highest places, <clears throat> from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love. So the whole poem is about love and how great their love is. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. What did God say about the promised land again? I forget. He'll bring them to the land of milk and honey. These people are in Israel, right? And he says, milk and honey are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. Cedar. Right? A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shove, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphire and spikenard and spikenard and saffron and calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. You know, that's, he's getting real mushy there, you know? Living waters. I know someone else talking about living waters. A lot of people in the Bible talk about living waters. Jesus talks about living waters coming from their belly. Revelation talks about living waters coming down from the throne in Jerusalem that we just read would be given freely to those who are in that kingdom. Right? So it's not just a love poem. It's a love poem, ultimately, about God and Israel. Amen. Some people have that realization or hear that, and they say, well, you're taken away from the romance. That's, no, it's not. It's like... The whole point is God's covenant with Israel and their failure to keep it and God returning them back because of his love toward them is the real romantic thing. Amen. These people, whoever wrote that, is dead already. But God and Israel, that's forever. Yeah. Right? Something's going on here. And so you see the Lebanon mentioned all over here, the streams from Lebanon from those mountains and the living waters there. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 15. Look up living waters in your digital concordance, and you'll do a good study there from Song of Solomon to the book of John to Revelation. Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 15. His legs, oh, his legs. Let's hear about his legs. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. Interesting. But that's obviously marble statues and gold are glorious things, aren't they? His countenance is as Lebanon. His countenance, his appearance is as Lebanon. A mountain? Like what? A cedar tree? Excellent as the cedars. So it's giving you interpretation here, folks. You're saying, I've never called my spouse, you look like a, a cedar tree. You know, I've, I've never said that. I've never said, you know, uh, that your, your, your countenance is as a, as a place. What it's telling us here is that when it mentions Lebanon and cedars, this is an excellent appearance. It's a glorious thing. I mean, marble and gold? That's what you see either in the Vatican or Benny Hinn's house. And these are glorious places, right? And so that, it's talking about a glorious place here. And this is what Hosea 14 is talking about, right? It says their roots will be as Lebanon, they'll last forever. He's talking about the flourishing of this country. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. Turn a couple pages to the right. And the Song of Solomon, you go to Isaiah 2 in verse 13. You know, when we start explaining the Song of Solomon, you're going to say something different to your spouses now, right? Like <laughs> Isaiah 2, verse 13, And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, it goes on to talk about this. And he's actually in Isaiah 2 talking about destroying these things. But notice he uses the cedars of Lebanon, the oaks of Bashan, to, to refer to high and lifted up places. This is a contemporary Christian song about being high and lifted up, right? Careful lifting yourself up. I'm pretty sure that's pride, right? But this is what prophecy is saying that Israel will be. Yes. But they will only be that when they realize that they can't get it on their own. Amen. See, remember Hosea 14? Receive us graciously. When that happens, God will be their due. He will flourish them, and he'll lift them up so that their being lifted up is not because of them, but because of God, just like the cedars of Lebanon, right? 
They can't boast. God planted those things. He made the trees, right? And so high lifted up places, that's what Lebanon means. That's what cedars Lebanon means. The excellent glory, that's what Lebanon means. And when it says their roots will be as Lebanon, they'll be high and lifted up, and they'll, be, they'll endure like the cedars of Lebanon. Some of the oldest trees in the world are trees mentioned in Hosea 14. Fir trees, pine trees, cedar trees, cypress trees, fig, olive trees, fig trees. Look up the list of oldest trees. There they are in Hosea 14. Now, there's two ways to think about that. Is one that these people in Hosea or who wrote the Bible knew that already or that God knew it already and put it in there. Either one. It kind of puts to shame sometimes modern scholarship. But Look at Isaiah 60, verse 13. Isaiah 60. The end of Isaiah talks about Israel's kingdom all throughout it. Isaiah 60 in verse 13. It says, The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. This is talking about Israel and their kingdom. Okay? We'll see this here just in a second. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. Song of Solomon is talking about the beauty of this woman. Isaiah 60 is talking about the beauty of God's sanctuary, which is the land of Israel and is Jerusalem. Amen. Right? And he says, the fir tree, the cedar tree, the pine tree, the box tree, they're, they're going to beautify the place. Now, when Solomon, it's interesting about when Solomon built the temple, his temple back there, he had these plants all over it. He had palm trees. He used cedar wood everywhere. Like he, the whole thing was built of cedar. He had gold and marble everywhere. He had lilies, like decorative lilies, like all over the, the, the top of these pillars and things like that. Like he used, he, he covered the whole temple in images and pictures and the real plants that these birds are talking about. And then the prophecies say the whole land will be like that. The idea was for Israel, when they entered into Solomon's temple, this glorious, magnificent place, that that was a picture of the entire land of Israel when the kingdom came. Amen. That's what it would be. So it would no longer be just a little place. It would be like the whole place. In the same way, at that time in Solomon's day, there was a tribe of priests, but in the kingdom, the whole nation would be priests. Yeah. And so the whole world would come to the land of Israel to see the glory of this place, because this is where the Lord's at. To get the healing from the, the leaves from these trees, right? To hear the wisdom that comes from it, from, to hear the truth, the, the light that comes from it. The city on a hill. And this is what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 60, um, in verse 13 then, is talking about the glory of God's sanctuary. I will make the place of my feet glorious. Remember who make the earth his footstool? Yeah. Well, what part of the earth? Israel. That's, right. That's where his footstool's at, right? And he'll make it glorious. So we talk about these trees. We talk about the glory of, what's the most glorious things in nature? What does what the Bible say? Men are like grass, and the glory of men are like the flower of the field, right? So if you're looking for something glorious, it's the flowers. It's not the, not the twigs, you know. It's the big tree with the fruit. It's the big mountains. It's these sort of things. And God made those things to teach us what's glorious. If you ever see these things and enjoy these things, you go, well, that's what glory tastes like. That's what glory looks like to a little degree. And what if you amplify that by a million? You know, well, that's God's glory. Amen. And that's why he made those things. And why we can thank God for those things now. Thank you for the sun and thank you for the trees and the flowers because it's a picture of those things. Look at Isaiah 60, verse 1. At this time when God's trying to beautify the place of a sanctuary, which is Israel, Isaiah 61, this is the same context. I arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Amen. Who is the thee here? Israel. Verse 3 says, The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Prophecy said Israel will be glorified, beautified, they, Hosea 14 is talking about that, right? They'll grow as the lilies. Yeah. He'll heal their backsliding. He'll show the love, and everyone will see that. And then it says, all the Gentiles will come to your glory and light. Yeah. That came from God. Right? And verse 4, lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they, uh, all they gather themselves together, they shall come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar. Thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. So Israel's going to come back in glory, and then all the nations are going to bring back anyone else that's out there that's Israel, brings them back. Verse 5 says, Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted into thee. 
the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. That's twice we've seen it in Isaiah 60 already. When Israel rises in glory, the Gentiles come to them. This is a repeated theme in, in, in prophecy. Not Isaiah 60, verse 9. Look down to verse 9. Surely the isles, the islands, the things way out there where the Gentiles live, shall wait for me in the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. When God glorifies Israel, it's God's glory, but it's through Israel, and the Gentiles come to see it and to praise it and to worship it. Amen. It says, verse 11, Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, that their kings may be brought. They're going to bring their, their greatness to you. Well, God's doing that today. People say, no, he's not. There were bombs just today in Tel Aviv, right? Like, that's not this. It doesn't say they'll bring their bombs and bomb your cities. It said they'll bring you glory and gold. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. That's not true today. Look at verse 13. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. We just read that, didn't we? The glory of Lebanon, all the glorious places. Drop down to verse, uh, uh, well, verse uh, 16 here, 16. Well, look at verse 14. The sons also of them that, afflict, uh, that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. That is not happening. But it will. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. What a prophecy. Thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am the, thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Amen. That is not true today. They don't claim that. They don't know that. They don't know who the Lord is. And they're not drinking the milk of the Gentiles. He says in verse 18, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. That's not happening in 2024. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. Wow. Verse 20, the sun shall no more go down, which means the sun goes down. Neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, Amen. and the days of thy morning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all righteous. That's different than Hosea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands. Do you see that? Isn't that Hosea 14? I will do it. I will do it. You'll be like the lilies. You're not going to work. I'm going to do it. Amen. Your roots will be like Lebanon forever. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one is a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it. So, so here's Isaiah 60, talking about Israel being established in excellence with a high countenance, because all the Gentiles go to its light, just like cedars of Lebanon, right? Lifted up in glory. That's what God's going to do to them. And at that time, when he lifts them up in glory, the Gentiles will come to them. Keep that in your mind for weeks down the road when we read Romans 11, 25. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Okay, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. Because when Israel is saved according to prophecy, the Gentiles come in. That's what goes on according to prophecy. Okay, but we'll get there in some weeks. Hosea 14, verse 6. His branches, who's the him again in the context here? This is Israel. He'll grow as the lily, he'll cast forth his roots as Lebanon, his branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. Who's the him again? Israel. He'll be as a beautiful olive tree. His smell as Lebanon. Lebanon, this is the, third, the second time it shows up here. His branches shall spread. Israel's going to be enlarged, okay? Um, in the Bible, if you haven't noticed yet, in the Bible, it talks about Israel and people as trees. Psalm 92 in verse 12, it says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So again, you have these excellent, lifted up, glorious trees, and he says the righteous are like that. Those that he planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God, our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. That is the righteous talking about Israel in Psalm 92, but you have the righteous here being trees. Israel's going to be righteous. Didn't Isaiah 60 say they'll all be righteous? I guess they'll all be like cedars of Lebanon. 
which is what Hosea 14 said. Proverbs 11, 28, 29 says, He that trusts in his riches shall fall. Well, are they doing that in Hosea 14? Nope. They said, Asher will not save us. We're not going to trust the work of our hands. We're not going to ride horses. We're going to trust God. He that trusts in riches shall fall. That's what they did before the kingdom come. That was the condemnation we've been studying about the last two months. God's saying, Israel, you're trusting your riches. You're trusting your own efforts. And that's why I'm going to judge you because you're breaking my law. But he says, the righteous shall flourish as a branch. He that troubles his own house shall inherit the wind. That's exactly Hosea. They sow to the wind, they reap the whirlwind. Remember that in Hosea? And the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. So again, you see the righteous here referred to a tree of life, to a cedar tree. It's talking about Israel being, being righteous. Prophecy, in prophecy, trees represent kingdoms and power and glory. That's what trees represent. The glory of the cedars of Lebanon, the power of the strength and the height of their countenance, right? Or dominions and kingdoms. How did Jesus teach Israel to pray? For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory. Not for mine is the kingdom, power, and glory, but the Lord's. It's his kingdom. Let's go back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4. Studying trees. You can't study trees like going to Daniel. One of the overlooked dreams that Daniel interprets is this dream of a tree. The most popular dream is the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, then you got, after that, maybe the goats and the beasts that he has. But Daniel 4, this interesting dream Nebuchadnezzar has about a tree. Daniel 4, verse 10. King says, there were visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. It was a big tree. The leaves were fair, the fruit was much, it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, the fowls of heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. That's a great tree. It's a big tree. He ends up asking Daniel what this means, since Daniel already interpreted James before for him. And so down in Daniel chapter 4, verse 20, Daniel says, The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached into the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much. He says in verse 22, It is thou, O king, you are the tree that art grown and become strong. Thy greatness is grown and reaches to heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. You see that? The tree is King Nebuchadnezzar and it's his dominion. It represents him and it's his dominion over all the earth. Trees grow out of the earth. They're rooted in the earth. They bear fruit for the earth. Things on the earth dwell underneath them and in them. A tree represents an earthly dominion. That's what it is. A tree doesn't rep represent a heavenly dominion. Okay, it's an earthly dominion here. We see this other places in the Bible. Judges chapter 9, in verse 8, there's a great story here, a parable perhaps, of trees. It's also a prophecy. Where it says, the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. The trees went forth. Obviously a figure, trees don't go forth like that. Went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign now over us. And it goes on to talk about the olive tree, and he rejects it because you know, I've already got my fruit. And it goes to the fig tree, and he's like, I got my fruit, don't want to reign over you. Right? And it goes to the, the vine. He says, I don't want to reign over you, I got my fruit. Eventually the bramble is what they turn to, but we're not going to get the interpretation of that. The point here is that trees were asked to reign over us. They're looking for a great tree to protect us, to shade us, to give us fruit. Right? Trees represent kingdoms and power and glory, and ultimately God's kingdom and power and glory is going to be done in the earth as it is in heaven. It's going to be represented by the tree that is rooted in Israel. Amen. Israel is going to be lifted up like the cedars of Lebanon, literally and figuratively as a people and in, in, in the plants in that place, and the world's going to come to it. Yes. Okay? That's what prophecy is talking about. Look at 1 Kings chapter 4. It's interesting studying these trees. Because Solomon did too. And he was the wisest man by divine gifting. 1 Kings 4. Let's, let's read in verse. Let's read in verse 30. 30, 29. 1 Kings 4, 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. That's how much Solomon's wisdom was. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country. You say, wise men from the east? Well, had nothing against Solomon. Okay. And all the wisdom of Egypt. 
You say the Egyptians were known as wise. Well, not wiser than Solomon. For he was wiser than all men, even Ethan. I don't know who that guy was, apparently a wise guy. Um, jump down to verse 32. His fame was in all the nations round about. He spake 3,000 proverbs. You don't have that many in your book. But he spake 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. You have one. Okay. He spake of trees. I think that's interesting. Like, what? He spake it. He wrote all these songs. He has all these proverbs. He's wiser than all these guys. And he spoke of trees. Like, he spoke of trees? He spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spake out also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. What is this talking about? You read Ecclesiastes, you hear about Solomon's exploits. He explains how he tried to search everything out. He was given wisdom, and in so doing, he tried to search everything out. He was probably the first natural historian, the naturalist here, learning about trees and animals, taxonomy, biology. Solomon did these things. Okay, that's what it's talking about there. He didn't just write about him in his poems and his songs, which he did, but he did that in his Song of Solomon because he understood what those trees did and were and what they... How do you describe things as plants and trees unless you understand them, right? And so he stood them out. He knew what they were for and what they did. He learned things. And there came, verse 34, that came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon for all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. Solomon was a picture of Christ and his kingdom. And Christ said there's, there's one greater than Solomon. That's him. But it's a picture of Christ and his kingdom. And Solomon's wisdom was the height of Israel's history when, man, silver and gold were there talking about like the gravel on the, on the, on the, on the road. And people were bringing them gifts, bringing Solomon to hear his wisdom and to hear what he wrote and to hear the songs that he sang and to hear the, the things he had discovered about the world, right? And they came all over the world to hear this from him. And that's what will happen when Christ reigns in Jerusalem. Amen. Right? They'll come all over the world to hear his wisdom, his political truth, his scientific truth, his religious truth, everything. They want to hear what he has to say. Because he knows. Yeah. And he saved Israel. And he brought them back from the dead. And that's what it'll be like. It's going to be like going to church, folks. <laughs> when you can talk to God, like, you need to find some things out. Amen. That's the kingdom on earth. 1 Kings 7.22 talks about Solomon and the house that he built. You know, these things, these trees we're seeing here in Hosea 14, the cedar trees and the, the fir trees and all that, I told you they're, they're all around the temple that Solomon built. It's also in his house, Solomon's house. I, I, I was reading about how big houses are, and apparently the, the general consensus is that if you have a house uh, greater than five or 6,000 square feet, you have a mansion. I don't know, anybody here? Have a, not me. Um, but uh, yeah, Stephen Furtick, uh, Elevation Church, has an 8,000-square-foot house. So he's got a mansion. Uh, Jeff Bezos has a 30,000-square-foot house mansion, right? Uh, Solomon had a 40,000-square-foot house, huge house, made of cedar beams, four floors, okay, 150 cubits one way, 50 cubits the other way. Huge, this thing. He made it out of cedar beams. Interesting. You make a building that big today, you don't necessarily make it out of cedar beams. But he did, right? He understood a few things. He did the same thing with his temple. He built this huge temple for God with cedar beams. Everything was cedar, floor to ceiling, everything, covered in gold too. So he had cedar, then covered in gold. Like, wow. That's like, you don't even see the value of the wood underneath because the gold's on the top of it. Like, glory upon glory is what that is. Yeah. So Solomon spoke of these things. He understood them, and he built things accordingly. Rich man, wise man. Vines, figs, olives, cedars, these things in the Bible, they mean things, and the Bible tells you what they mean. Not hidden symbols. They're simply things that Solomon learned and taught and people understood, and he used them to describe what God promised to Israel. The vine tree, for example, the vineyard, we saw in Isaiah 5, was the house of Israel, the house of Judah, the house of them. National Israel is referred to as a vine, okay? And when the vine bears fruit, then that's Israel in their country as a nation rejoicing. Yes. The fig tree, we saw the fig tree in the Garden of Eden. Remember when Adam and Eve tried to save themselves from their sin by covering it up with fig leaves. Okay, fig trees apparently, because of their goodness, refers to good works, the sweetness of those sort of things. Good works of mercy and things like that, which could be good or bad, right? Like good works are good, unless you're trusting in them for your salvation, and then they're bad. Jesus came and he saw a fig tree in Israel and it had no fruit on it whatsoever, which meant there was no good works in Israel, at least the ones he counted as good works. They did the tithes and stuff, but not the judgment and the mercy and the faith, right? 
olive trees in the Bible speak to the oil that they produce, and thus the light that would be in the temple, and speak to the light or the, the truth or the faith and the spiritual aspect of Israel. So spiritual Israel is what that is, right? It's what they believe. Yes. As their, their city can be destroyed. The temple could be ransacked. But if that candlestick kept its light burning, what did they have? Hope, right? They had faith and belief. It was spiritual Israel. What happens when Jesus comes to Israel and Paul goes to Israel and they don't have faith? I guess they're an olive tree without fruit is what you call that. And so what do you do with the tree whose branches aren't bearing fruit? Cut those branches off, yes. right? And that's what Paul describes in Romans 11. It's the same thing described in Hosea 14 and all throughout the Old Testament, okay? Cedar trees we've already seen have to do with appearance and countenance and glory. That's when Israel's a cedar tree. It's like, wow, that's when your glory is apparent. It's not some hidden glory. It's like apparent glory, which is amazing because you and I don't have that. We've got the hope of glory. We've got heavenly glory. We have the glory of his grace, but apparent glory, like are you looking at me for glory, you're not going to see it. One day you will, but not now. But Israel, when their kingdom comes, people will see glory. Right? They'll see it. It'll be apparent, just like the cedar trees. Go back to Hosea 14 in verse 6. Their beauty shall be as the uh, his branches shall spread, as a, uh, uh, shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. The branches spreading there has to do with the dominion, spreading all over the earth, right? His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. So what's that tell you? If, once I told you here what these trees meant, that their beauty is found in their faith, in their trust in the Lord, yeah. right? But it'll be as the olive tree, like an actual olive tree is also beautiful. And the idea of an olive tree being beautiful, a tree is beautiful when it's trimmed and when it's bearing fruit and has leaves on it, yes. trees aren't at their beautiful around this time of, well, maybe this time with the leaf colors, but after the fall, <laughs> you get a bunch of trees with branches and no leaves on the things. Yes. And this looks like death everywhere. You're just like, huh. can't wait for the spring for the leaves to come out and then for the flowers and then for the fruit, right? The fall is a nice color, but life is leaving. <laughs> We all realize that. It's the fall of life, right? But the beauty of an olive tree is when it has the leaves and it has the fruit and it has the blossoms. It's not a beautiful olive tree when it doesn't have the blossoms, when it doesn't have the fruit, when it's just an olive branch, right? That's, that's, that gets cut off. It doesn't bear the fruit. And so Romans 11 talks about Israel's return and their fullness, and that's when they're going to be a beautiful olive tree, Okay. Their smell will be as Lebanon. It says, verse 7 says, They that dwell under his shadow shall return, and they shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. When you have a, I used to live at a house with a small apple orchard in it, and when we moved into the house, there were these apple trees that had obviously been planted intentionally in these rows, but they have been overgrown, Right? And when trees overgrow each other, you know, the roots get all connected and all this. And so parts of the tree start dying off because the trees are getting too big in different areas and they stop bearing fruit at certain other places. And so, look, apple orchard, not very pretty. It's, it's kind of wild. It's overgrown and, and, and that sort of thing. So you just start trimming things off and, and, and fixing it up to make it more clear. Um, it may, make, make it more clear that what its glory is supposed to be. Um, when God planted Israel in the wilderness... Right? That's what he was doing. When he says, I'll bring you back from the wilderness and from the desert, so I'll, I'll plant the fir trees and the pine trees, and I'll make your beauty glorious. He's not going to make them wild and ugly. Right? right? And he's going to, to make them something that he intended for them to, to have. Isaiah 5 talks about a vineyard that God planted. He made it so an environment such that they can flourish, and yet they brought forth wild grapes. Why didn't they bring forth the fruit which he intended for them by giving them this environment? And he said he's going to destroy it. He's going to replant it. Yeah. Right? Hosea 14 is prophesying of the planting of Israel that will never be replanted again because this planting will bear the right fruit. Yeah. Okay. It talks about the return. Those that, that dwell under his shadow shall return. Whose shadow? Like the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. 
says, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. This is the man talking here. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. That's the woman talking here. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He's a tree, apparently. She's talking about her as a lily that grows up without her effort because he performs it for her. And then he's talk, she's talking about him as a tree that she dwells under the shadow of, right? When Hosea 14 says, they that, they that dwell under his shadow, who's responsible for making this tree flourish here? Well, the Lord. The Lord is. Well, who is this? Look at Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest. There'll be a place you can dwell under and be protected, right? As rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. That sounds familiar. Jesus came and said, I am he, look at what I can do. If you have ears to hear, if you have eyes to see, that's Isaiah 32 verse three. He's the man, he's the one providing the shadow. He's the one that's gonna make Israel glorious. He's the one preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's the one that was prophesied in Song of Psalms 2, verse 1 through 3. That's why he's the lily of the valley. That's why he's the rose of Sharon. That's, that's why he's those things. He is the tree that, that has this shadow. That's the beloved. All over Song of Solomon, you see this term beloved, the beloved. Who's my beloved? Amen. Well, you're accepted in the beloved, aren't you? Amen. Jesus Christ is beloved of God, the Father, and you're accepted in him. And Jesus is the Lord God who comes back and provides for Israel, and they become this tree. Those that dwell in his shadow shall return. Hosea is talking about the return of Israel. This final passage in Hosea, where the whole book was talking about them not being God's people and them not getting mercy and them getting God's judgment. The end of Hosea, he's saying, you're going to return. Amen. It's going to be under my shadow. I will make you grow. I will make you flourish. And you'll return. As long as you dwell under my shadow. As long as you follow me. Yeah. If they say, no, go for some other, other tree or something, you know. And they won't get in. But it says, they shall revive as the corn. Revive. We've seen that word before in Hosea 6. They're going to come back from the dead. Paul says in Romans 11, verse 15, what shall their, if their, if their fall is a salvation of, uh, to the Gentiles and reconciling the world, what shall the return be but, the, but life from the dead? Amen. Hosea says that they'll be revived from the dead. We covered that in Hosea 13 as well. They'll grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. So there's a time when Israel's seed prospers and their remnant returns. Look at Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah can be a difficult, uh, difficult, difficult book. But it makes it easier when you find there's things that it mentions that cross-reference to other prophets. That really helps you a lot. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 1. Again the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with great fury. Kind of like Hosea when his wife went to other men and he was jealous over her and angry and that sort of thing. And God's anger towards Israel because they were committing spiritual idolatry and adultery um, showed manifest in God's fury and wrath. But verse three says, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Zion. So I was jealous for them in my fury and my wrath, but verse three says, I am returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Well, that's, all the prophecies have been reading about. Okay. Look down at verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Amen. That's Hosea 14. If they dwell in my shadow, they'll return. Okay. Verse 10 is Zechariah 8. It says, For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. There was tribulation. There's turmoil, right? For I set all men, every one, against his neighbor. But now, that's an interesting but now, because that's not now, but now. That's like 
now in Zechariah 8, which is the future for Israel. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people, as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their dew. I will be as the dew unto them, Hosea says. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Wow, that's interesting. It says, It shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you. I will heal them. I will love them. I will be as the dew. Here it says, I will save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts. Wow, that sounds like the same prophecy of Hosea 14. Same prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. Israel's return. It's the same prophecy Hosea has made already three other times. Go back to Hosea chapter 1. We're wrapping up the book. We can't help but go back to Hosea 1 just to remind ourselves of what was alluded to back here. Hosea 1, the whole chapter was about these three children where God said, I will not be Israel's God anymore. They will not be my people. I will not have mercy upon Israel. I will destroy the line of Jehu and Jezreel. But then at the end of Hosea 1, verse 10, it says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be, after they're not my people, after I don't show them mercy, yet after that, the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Where is that place? Israel is that place. Verse 11 says, Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come, out, come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Remember that prophecy in chapter 1? That's Hosea 14 in detail here. Look at chapter 2, Hosea chapter 2. Verse 21, it shall come to pass, and that day I will hear, saith the Lord. Hosea 2 is about the adulterous wife who's going away, and he's trying to bring her back. And eventually he says, I'm going to cut off all of her paths so she can't go to her lovers. And I'm going to bring her back to the wilderness. I'm going to woo her in the wilderness. Remember that? And I'm going to bring her back in my love. And he says, in verse 19, I'll betroth thee unto me forever. In verse 21, it says, I will hear, the, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me, I'll plant her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that we're not my people, thou art my people. And they'll say, thou art my God. They'll say, receive us graciously. They'll say, thank you. Hosea 3, verse 5. After Israel is taken out of the land and destroyed and is without their land, afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God. Hosea 1, 2, and 3 starts out with this, this, this prophecy of judgment and ends with this, they're going to come back. Hosea, like many prophets, talk about the destruction of, and judgment against Israel and Judah, but all throughout it, there's this hope, and Hosea 14 ends with this hope of Israel's return. And that's the final point Hosea makes. Okay, and look what he says in the last two verses here. Hosea 14, 8. He says, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> Ephraim. Like, that only means something to you after 19 weeks of studying Ephraim and saying, avoid Ephraim. Ephraim's idolatrous. Ephraim was wicked. Ephraim's going to be judged. Ephraim's going to be destroyed. Ephraim's going to be taken out of his land. And now Ephraim says, what do I have to do with idols anymore? Right? That would be a good day. Yeah. I have heard him and observed him. Ephraim's heard God. I am like a green fir tree. There's a tree again. What's that talking about? You know, it's interesting. The first mention of Ephraim and Hosea, back in chapter 4, verse 17, says to avoid Ephraim because of his idols. Hosea 4, verse 17 says, uh, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. But now, at this time in Hosea 14, 8, which is Israel's future kingdom, they won't be idolatrous. All right? Amen. There'll be a green fir tree, is what he says. What's the big deal about a green fir tree? It's only one of the oldest trees living on the planet right now. Yep. Right? It's a green one, by the way. Look up the oldest tree on the planet today, which is called Methuselah. Not that green looking. I mean, you're kind of like, oh, well, that's a... They call him Methuselah, which is the oldest man in the Bible, which is interesting. But uh, uh, it's kind of branchy, you know. But a green fir tree, wow. Planted by the Lord is what's going to happen there. In the wild to live forever. Look, look at Isaiah 41 real quick here. Isaiah 41 talks about this idea. Isaiah 41, verse 17. 
When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue fails for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitta tree, the myrtle, and the oil tree, olive oil. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine, the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Why did God send Israel to the wilderness in Exodus? So that when God saved them from that, they, the world would know that they did it. They were slaves in Egypt. He parted the waters. He provided daily bread for them. They could not have survived any other way, right? He conquered a, an enemy that was greater than, bigger than them. The Holy One of Israel did it. It's going to be the same thing when their kingdom comes. And so when Ephraim says it'll be like a green fir tree, it's talking about that. I'm going to let God plant me and grow me and strengthen me, and the Lord is my strength. The Lord will be my shepherd. The Lord will be the gate and the door. Wow. Israel's kingdom in Revelation... The kingdom on the earth, Revelation 7, there's 144,000 witnesses there, 12,000 in each tribe. And it's interesting to look at the names of the tribes. Ephraim is not mentioned. Manasseh is. Instead of Ephraim, however, is Joseph. Which is fascinating. Joseph and Manasseh. Well, Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh is mentioned in Revelation 7, but instead of Ephraim, Joseph. Which is fascinating. So you see Ephraim in Israel's future tribulation to go into the kingdom. He's the second son. Okay, he's given a new name, Joseph, his father's name. Even though he's the one of the two that, according to Scripture, was more wicked, and he was the second son. Jesus taught in his ministry, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. It's one more example in the Scripture of the second becoming the first, of Ephraim taking his father's name and entering that kingdom. It's interesting. Hosea 14, verse 9 says, Who is wise? Oh, we skipped over the last part of verse 8. I'm like a green fir tree, from me is thy fruit found. That's an amazing statement because Ephraim means fruitful. And he was everything but all throughout history until then, until this kingdom. And then Ephraim becomes fruitful. He lives up to his name. Verse 9, who is wise and he shall understand these things? Prudent, he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall. Who is wise and to understand? Well, Proverbs 9, 10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, Paul says, be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Psalm 107, 43 says, whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Loving kindness is the Old Testament word for grace. That's what that is. And so it's not an accident when Paul today says, consider what I say, the apostle of grace, the dispenser of God's grace, so you can understand God's grace, and you'll understand all things. You'll understand all of Scripture when you understand God's grace because God is gracious. And when he brings Israel back, you know why and how he can. And it's going to be glorious because he promised them physical healing and promised them physical salvation and a bunch of fruit trees. Right? And so when it says the just shall walk in the ways of the Lord, he's right. Let God be true and remain a liar. Right? He's right in his judgment. He's right in his mercy. He's right whatever he does. You read the prophets, you can glory in God and that his judgment is true. And you can glory in God and his grace is merciful. Amen. Right? The just shall walk in them. They'll respect letting God be true, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Which means this final instruction to Israel here is that there's going to be judgment. There's going to be hope in the end. You need to walk in the ways of the Lord. Amen. Which means they, even though they're removed from their land and facing God's judgment, need to endure to the end, to hope for this grace and glory, right? Amen. That is exactly the instruction of the book of Hebrews for the believing remnant of Israel that Jesus created as they're outside their city waiting to get into their kingdom. Yes. It's the same instruction. Amen. Hosea 14.9 is the book of Hebrews. Yes. Okay. So who understands these things? Well, Israel will when Jesus reveals it to them in the book of Hebrews in Revelation. That's the instruction. Follow the way of the Lord. The just shall walk in them. The transgressors shall fall therein. And that's what you see in Revelation, right? If you don't abide in Christ, he cuts you off. In Revelation, if you take that mark and reject the mark of God, then you get burnt up. It's like, that's the transgressors. 
but the just trust the Lord, they trust what he provides, and they hope for that glorious coming when they'll be lifted up, when Christ returns and makes low the high places and lifts up the low places, Amen. and that's when Israel gets their glory. Okay, so that's Hosea after 19 weeks. Any questions or comments about that book? Thank you for studying with me through it. It's a fun book.